right in the middle. <laughs> the axis. I want to keep mine very small and short. Are you all ready? Everybody, can you all hear me? No, yes, no. Hello, hello. Make sure I don't break this thing. How's the sound? Can anybody, everybody here in the back? How's that? Any better? All right, if everybody, if everybody could take a seat. No, right, that worked. Okay. All right. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming today. Uh, my name is Gene McEwen. For those of you uh, who don't know me, uh, welcome back to Ford and welcome home. You know, we know there's a lot going on uh, at Ford today. Everybody's, or a lot of folks have family in, so we're going to try to keep all of this to about two hours. Uh, there'll be plenty of time at the end for questions. Um, assuming my machine doesn't blow up here. You know, we're going to have these types of meetings uh, as well as produce written materials uh, as we have information we're sharing. We'll do our best to keep everyone informed of the progress of the project as we go. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time, and you'll see the fruits of that labor here in a little bit uh, when Christian gets going, but it's beginning to, uh, I think, come together in a very nice way. Um, in the interim, uh, if you have any questions about anything or you hear anything that is disturbing, I know this place, rumors never filter around at all, uh, but if you hear something uh, and it's troubling, you know, pick up the phone, call me. I do have a day job, but, you know, I don't want uh, fake news out there, and I'd rather nip it in the butt, you know, if you hear something. So please give me a call, and we'll talk about it. Um, before we get started, I want to introduce the core of the design and development team. Christian Satil, who those of you who were here last time met, uh, Anthony Sissel, Craig Clements, all of Satil and Satil, Josh Brooks, back here in the corner of Brooks Construction, and then Chris Tippett of McAlpine Architects, the new member to the team that we'll talk about. If no one has uh, already Googled these guys, I suggest you do it. They're all very impressive in their own right. Um, we recently added the McAlpine uh, Architect Group, really to focus on our residential designs. Um, they're working very closely with Satil and Satil, really in an effort to round out the entire design team, and we think we have an absolute best-in-class group working on that, so we're very, very th thrilled with it. Overall, um, I think for HMAF, we couldn't be more happy with the entire project team that we have put in place so far. Um, recognizing not everyone's on the same page uh, or was in the last meeting relative to the project, and it's, you know, it's hard to realize it was this long ago, but our last meeting was nearly a year ago. Uh, I want to begin with a brief overview and some history on how and why we are where we are and really touch on the project timeline as well. Uh, all of this I think will be important for those who really haven't followed the project closely to really put in context what Christians are going to be talking about later. Unless you just can't stand it, we'd appreciate it if you hold questions to the end. We have a big group and we really want to get through all the materials. I think it's important to do that. Um, we will all be around 
after the presentation to uh, talk about a lot of this further. So with that, um, I'm going to start and again try to do a little bit of an overview. Uh, there's a lot that's transpired since HMAF got involved in this in early 2016 um, when we you know, formed to uh, control the 67 lots and 63 memberships that are owned by Ameris Bank. As many of you know, these were formerly owned by SBI that was foreclosed upon by the bank and then subsequently went, you know, went into bankruptcy. We entered into a contract to acquire the lots in May of 2016 for roughly $1.725 million. That's a price that we feel really good about. You know, given the importance of these unsold lots and memberships and their eventual development to the club, many of us have believed, you know, for a really long time that the Ford membership should control all these lots, uh, in particular after the demise of SBI and the very negative impact that had on the club. It's really indicative of, you know, what can happen sometimes when you get third parties who are not fully aligned with the community that they're developing in. So forming HMEF really only occurred after numerous meetings between the members of the club board and third party developers interested in buying the Ameris Bank assets failed to produce really a group of capital or any vision or any viable you know, plan to develop and monetize the lots. Um, a lot of effort went into that and I was a part of it early on, uh, so I had some special insights into it. And, um, you know, and that's a lot, to a great extent really what uh, brought us where we are here today. Um, even after HMAF put the lots under contract, we still talked to interested third-party developers in the hopes of identifying a group who could step in for us after we had the lots under contract. Um, some of the developers that we interviewed really just wanted to come in and sell lots. Obviously, that's not worked before. We didn't think it would work again. Um, you know, others wanted to build a hotel, others multifamily. Uh, one wanted to build track homes with a home price of roughly $200,000 each. Obviously, none of that you know, plays into what Ford's all about. Uh, wouldn't have been viable and certainly would not have been in Ford's best interest. Um, HMAF didn't purchase this or pursue this project because, you know, all of us have a ton of spare time, nothing to do. Uh, you know, I have a day job. Everybody else who started this, you know, Ben and, uh, and Bob, you know, had day jobs. But we did it because we thought it was critical to the future of the club and really the best way to generate net new members and preserve what we have here at Ford. Also, it was very clear there was no alternative. And I think this has all been substantiated by the work that the, the board's you know, consultants have done really at identifying, you know, critical steps in the strategic plan. As many of you are aware, since contracting to acquire the bank assets in early 2016, HMAF has had to manage through a few uh, less, you know, we'll say, productive uh, matters beyond HMAF, the city, club and POA board's control that together cost us, you know, some time and money. We believe that all that negativity really uh, brought the membership together, uh, certainly around the project. Uh, I think the membership as a whole uh, values what's being done. And I think certainly, you know, for the founders uh, who have backstopped this project, it's really galvanized their resolve. So there is a silver lining. Sometimes you have to look for it a little harder than other times. You're now going to move uh, forward with the project, and we are, have been moving very forward in a robust manner. I think, again, you'll see the results of that. We've had throughout the project a great working relationship with the club and the POA with complete alignment of interest to benefit the membership. Uh, I'll pat the board, uh, both boards on the back a little bit. It's rare uh, that, you know, you have leadership in an environment like this where the board members can focus on really what's important. You know, it's really been refreshing and it's been critical to moving this forward. We'll continue to coordinate with the ARB and town architects as we advance our design elements and plans and build on the core concepts we shared with the membership at our first meeting back in November. Um, I think, you know, work to date with Rajma and, and the you know, town architect deal has been very good and it's been very productive. And I think we're all on the same page about what we're trying to uh, achieve. So with that, um, let me move into some milestones. Yeah, back up one, there we go. Yeah, and this is, again, kind of a refresher. We put in place a, uh, 
great development and design team I just introduced, so we're thrilled about that. Um, we've negotiated all the club and POA documents and agreements. Those are all in place. In January of this year, the City of Richmond Hill gave us conceptual approval of the HMAF master plan amendment needed to progress the project. This is a very complex and important first step in getting the city's uh, approvals uh, started. Uh, in January, HMAF also closed on the founder capital raise where Ford members contributed $5 million in equity to fund the initial capital plan for the project in increments of $250,000 per share. <coughs> in June, HMAF closed on the purchase of the Ameris Bank assets. We don't need to go into why it took from January to June, but it did. Uh, recently, the city gave us final master plan approval, which is great, and another step forward in our, in our city approval process. And then we expect our final plat approval from the city in the near future, which will allow us to really begin to execute on our development plans, finalize our infrastructure, and begin development and construction activities within Silk Hope, which I'll talk about in a second is the, the heart of the project. Before turning the, the uh, presentation over to Christian, I want to also address a few key characteristics that are unique and critical to the success of the project. Christian will embellish on these as he does in a much more eloquent way than I do. He also has all the pretty pictures, so it's actually easier, I think. Um, of the 67 lots HMF acquired, 24 of the original configured lots are in Silk Hope, with the rest generally located near Pecan Grove, along Dogwood Way, in the marina, and McAllister Point. This is really important because, again, Silk Hope is the focus of the project in those initial 24 lots. The key to the project's development really also begins with the efficient utilization of the existing infrastructure in Silk Hope, along with the replat and reconfiguration of the existing lots in a way that allows us to create a new and unique village-style environment, uh, much in the same way uh, of you know, what the original developers did in Cherry Hill, where they created a, a very successful community early on in, in Ford's life. You know, the key to this, again, is a new neighborhood within Ford that will really complete you know, the development of the Ford plantation. We think the new Silk Hope will be unlike anything in the Low Country. We'll build upon the legacy of Ford and be something that all of us can be very proud of as members. Importantly, the replat within Silk Hope will increase the number of home sites from 24 to 53 lots. Most on the north end of the property near the marsh, in particular along the expanded and amenitized Riceland Way that we'll get into later. This is critical to the development of this neighborhood and creating some critical mass to really give the neighborhood you know, some character and some presence. I want to mention for the benefit of anyone out in the audience doing the math and going, wow, didn't he just create 29 new lots? Well, you're right. But you know, we thought of that, and we all recognize you know, we can only have 400 lots. And so we have managed through that. Um, as a part of the project, one of the agreements we have in place is what we call a swap agreement with the club and POA. The net effect of that, and it's much more complicated than this, is, is that HMAF has and will deed effectively 29 lots to the POA and club. And you know, they will, um, you know, over time, retire those and turn them into green area. HMAF, net of the swap, will have developable lots, uh, buildable homes in Silcope, obviously, the marina, and McAllister Point. Another key to the project is that we are not selling lots. This is really important. Um, you know, one of the reasons we were able to buy the lots and the membership so cheaply from the bank is we convinced them that you know, a lot of lots uh, aren't worth much unless you put a home on them. And they understood that. And so what we are doing here is we're not selling lots, we're selling homes that HMAF will build. All these homes will be architecturally consistent with our vision for this specific neighborhood, in particular in Silk Hope, again, which is the focus today. There may be a few estate lot sale exceptions uh, in Silk Hope uh, or maybe in you know, McAllister, but our goal is to build 53 homes in Silk Hope and 67 homes overall. 
As a part of the village concept, HMAF will build and convey to the club and POA at no cost to them a spectacular entertainment pavilion, an elegant walking garden, will amenitize Oak Alley, will relocate and build a new Edsel farm, all of this within Silk Hope. This is really going to be the heart of what Christian's going to be talking about here in a little bit, along with the home designs. While we put these amenities in, uh, we will also be building model homes in Silk Hope. You know, anyone who's been around the development business knows people like to reach out and touch and see. You know, some will buy off a of paper, but most want to see what it's going to look like. And so that's going to be a focus, and we're going to do that in Silk Hope. We also plan to offer various price points and complementary styles of single family homes within Silk Hope and offer everything from a spacious cottage style home sized at 2,500 square feet to an estate home up to call it 3,800 square feet, all with first floor master suite living. So from our first meeting, you know, our footprints have grown a little bit and this stuff will continue to evolve. But what we think we're gonna offer is you know, a really nice high-end product that will be very unique and we think very attractive to anyone who wants to become a part of the Ford Plantation and our club here. Again, please keep in mind these are conceptual, architectural uh, ideas. Uh, they're fairly uh, far advanced at this point, but they're going to continue to evolve uh, as we finalize our plans and, and we come up with our construction estimates. because. At the end of the day, it's all about what we can build them for. We want everything to be high quality in the, in the standard upon which we expect around here, but we also want them to be very competitively priced. Um, you know, we want to move these things out as quickly as we can because, you know, it doesn't take, you know, a math degree to understand what, you know, 60 plus new net members does for this club. We'll not talk today. Um, about the HMAF lots that are owned in McAllister Point and Silk Hope. Uh, but suffice it to say, we're going to stick with the architectural guidelines that are there for the homes that we build in those communities. Uh, so, you know, I think the real creativity, you know, will go for uh, Silk Hope. Before I turn the presentation over to Christian, let me touch on some key target development dates we're trying to reach. These may change as we get into the construction and development stage of the project, but we feel pretty good about where we are and our ability to hit these dates, and we're going to keep the pressure on to do that. We expect final design approval for all amenities and home designs within the next 60 to 90 days. Amenity and infrastructure construction should begin late spring of 2018. Home and amenity construction plans and approvals you know, should be in place by spring of 18. Construction budgets and home pricing, uh, we hope to have established within that same general time frame. Obviously, we cannot set our prices until we uh, do that and begin our pre-marketing, which we're going to try to begin in the late fall of 2017 without prices. <coughs> and then as we set up our marketing center in the spring to early summer of 2018, um, you know, we expect to have a full-fledged center with uh, a lot of stuff under construction and Silk Hope, our models under construction and our pricing in place. Uh, as I noted a minute ago, we we're going to build two models uh, that will start on generally the same time frame, early summer, early fall of 18. And then, you know, with a little bit of luck and some work, you know, we hope to have a number of pre-sales and begin those under construction at the same time. So hopefully you can see with all the planning and work we've been doing behind the scenes, we're moving really very quickly into the construction phase of the project and hope to be moving some dirt here before long. You know, we've spent some time trying to clean up Silk Hope uh, after the hurricane and begin doing a little bit of work. You'll see that continue as we move towards construction. Um, so we're excited about that. So with that, I will turn it over to Christian. Uh, and again, we'll wrap up with questions and um, I'll do closing remarks when Christian's finished. Okay. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. 
It's, a, it's a, a, a real pleasure and an honor to be back here. Gene, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, and, and I have to say, I hope our presentation is as organized as, as you might think it is. Uh, we've been busy, and you know, it, we, we've been looking forward to an opportunity to put pencils down for a few minutes to share with you all the progress over the last nearly a year since we presented to you. So, um, so I am here today with our team from Sotil and Sotil. Um, Chris Tippett will also be presenting with me today. Um, but we are, as I said, I mean, we're, we're just we're really excited and honored to be back here. And it's been an amazing year working closely with, um, with Ford Plantation and the development team. Um, Reshma Johnson, the town architect, now Tom Draffin uh, in support, uh, have been wonderful to work with. Um, Mark Ray, and, and we can't say enough, this has been an amazing effort to create something truly special without comparison in the low country. So we, 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 we are honored and excited to be a part of this historical moment for Ford Plantation. Um, our firm, Sotil & Sotil, is based here in the Low Country in Savannah. Much of our work, and I, we've had a chance to meet many of you over the last year, um, but for those of you that, that don't know us, much of our work is based in historic places. We, um, we work on planning at, uh, at various scales. We're always interested in how places change and evolve over time so we can be a part of that process and be, be a contributor to that dialogue, and, and Ford is um, such a rich place for, for that reason alone. Um, so what I wanted to do today was show you what we've been up to. We have been building on the foundational concepts that we presented to you at the last um, large gathering, and, and I think you'll, you'll see that we've stayed very true to everything that we set a course for um, nearly a year ago. Um, but for those of you who maybe didn't see that presentation, I've condensed a few of the images to show our process, sort of how we got to where we, um, where we are and, and what built the foundation for the, for the thinking uh, for Silco. Um, and like anything, it began with really understanding the geography of this area. Uh, and so we studied the historical maps. We looked at the, uh, the land masses that sort of put Ford Plantation into context. And we think about where McAllister Point is today and where Cherry Hill is and where we'll be working uh, over on Silk Hope. You start to understand that um, the, the context of this, the, the land as it relates to the, um, to, to the development and the trajectory of Ford. Um, and also former lines on the landscape, the old um, rice uh, plantations. Um, of course, the Oak Alley in Silk Hope is, a, is an important um, design driver. So we studied many maps as we began to form our foundation. And then, of course, um, we studied Ford Plantation as we know it today, um, recognizing that in this, this larger plantation environment, there are you know, two really well-formed neighborhoods that have strong identity points for, for being in Ford Plantation. Two neighborhoods that are more pedestrian-oriented in character. So of course, Cherry Hill, um, right in the center, and then McAllister Point uh, on the uh, eastern edge. So as we thought about the marina, Silk Hope Marina and the Silk Hope Village, um, we realized that the task at hand is really to complete Ford Plantation, to create the third neighborhood, the third village context in the larger arc of the, the estate uh, plantation environment of Ford. Um, so we endeavor to understand that and look at what makes each of those areas unique in their own right, but also part of a larger theme that's part of Ford plantation. So studying, for example, in McAllister Point, the character of walks, paving materials, and details, sort of an understated elegance that's there. Um, looking at how McAllister Point meets uh, the marsh. Looking at how amenities that are shared by the whole community are organized within these, these more walkable parts of Ford Plantation was a priority of ours. As we thought about what we would do in Silk Hope, how do we do it within a, a conversation that's already um, well underway here. So we think about architecture. There's no question that the, 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 the main home forms the, the core DNA for what happens here and starts to affect the way we think about colors and materials and sort of the architectural syntax uh, of the plantation. And there's a, I think there's just an exquisite balance here at Ford of these moments of formality set within the plantation, the larger plantation and, and the, the, the stunning landscape of the low country. These, 
signature live oak trees with, and then moments of sort of a, a formality that really, I think, leaves a, a, a clear, strong, memorable um, uh, impression as you, as you enjoy Ford as a whole. So of course we see that at the main house. And then as we move out into the plantation, understanding the many architectures that are here already that are a part of Ford Plantation uh, as we move through uh, and, and study uh, and move from neighborhood to neighborhood. Of course, Cherry Hill uh, in its own right has an ex a very distinctive quality to it with predominant uh, use of wood uh, siding on those homes, you know, face forward porches, more of a, 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 a low country cottage model that defines a really clear um, and bright identity um, at, at, at different size, sizes and scales. Of course, civic elements or community shared elements of the estate hold it together. Um, in Cherry Hill, we were particularly taken with the quality and the compactness of the, uh, of the network of streets and lanes that move through there. We spent some time measuring those up early on to understand that because we felt like that's the kind of um, proximity that we, we want to achieve as we think about Silcope. As well, uh, some of the elements that are disposed throughout the community that provide moments of pause and rest. Uh, uh, and we see you know, several of those there in Cherry Hill. As we move um, west towards Silk Hope Harbor, of course, the, the architecture of the marina is a, is a much more vertical, a more upright kind of architecture. Um, it's part of our context, but, but we're really moving back into, um, into the plantation environment. So as we move down uh, Silk Hope Drive and, and Little Lulu Lane, we start to see um, other kinds of architecture that we feel will help us think about identity in Silk Hope as we take next steps. Um, we're taken by the palette of some of the materials that are part of the community realm. And I, I think you know, the, the elegance of the, uh, the, the entry posts there at the marina with the tabby uh, shell, uh, cast concrete um, uh, and stucco forms a really, we think, an important identity that is something that we um, can build on as we go along. So with all of that, we'll, we'll move our, our focus now over to Silk Hope. And um, part of our understanding, of course, is coming into the neighborhood, either on Little Lulu Lane or on, on Silk Hope Drive toward the Grand Allee. Um, and we've studied each of these approaches um, over and over again, really sort of getting them in our bones as we think about what does it mean to approach and arrive uh, at what we know as, as the paddock there today. Or coming up onto the, um, the Oak Allee uh, from Silk Hope Drive. We've studied each of these approaches. We've looked at the material palettes and the details so that we can work within a context that will be new and unique, but also very much part of Ford Plantation. And we've, and we've taken that apart layer by layer, understanding the LA, um, as we think about the, the context of the neighborhood, that forms a strong uh, centering point, the old paddock, a centering point. The area on Riceland Way on the bird sanctuary, another strong point and then the, the berm uh, that, that runs along the western edge of the property there, down toward um, Lake Butler. Again, we've measured it up. We look much smaller in this view. This is an enormous uh, space, over 100 feet wide and fi 500 feet long. Just wonderful. It reminds us of other precedents for LA's uh, right here in, in the low country. This is actually right in the heart of Savannah. It's Oglethorpe Avenue. Um, in its early days. Of course, it was all filled up with azaleas because the traffic engineers didn't like people enjoying that space as much as they were. Um, but we're reminded of those dimensions and what's possible in those spaces. And then the, we were taken by the quality of the paddock uh, there at the heart of the neighborhood. And then looking back down um, Riceland. We were also taken by the amount of, of property that is sort of under underserving right now along the western edge, um, the easement that runs down to Lake Butler, an interesting asset. And then as we move out to Riceland, views out over the marsh uh, there uh, where the sanctuary is. So taking all that in mind, we started to really think about it, these various character areas, um, thinking about the area along uh, Riceland along the sanctuary is one, and it's the area that's going to have the most um, uh, sort of a compact quality to the homes. The area surrounding the Oak Alley as another, and then the area where the, the Silk Hope Village and the plantation meet uh, is really sort of the, the third area 
um, with a sort of a feathering of the village character back to the larger plantation. And we thought about those view sheds entering the neighborhood, uh, both from the north and from the south. Um, and back to the LA and the paddock. Um, the trees rule. We, the, an important early step here was really discerning the, uh, the trees that are in this area, because there are some unbelievably beautiful trees um, that are currently, in many cases, sort of buried or encumbered um, by other smaller trees that are competing with them. But we've, we've taken time and been back many times to study each tree in uh, the Silk Hope neighborhood to, um, to assess quality and, and to be able to think about the stewardship of these legacy trees um, as we go along. This one in particular, which has been nicknamed the Medusa tree, uh, lies just off the LA, uh, near the, uh, closer up to Riceland. So, um, so that's a common theme as we've, we've gotten to know the geography of Silcope is, is finding these trees sort of buried, um, in, in many cases, um, sort of competing uh, for light and air. Um, so, so that was very much a part of our, our early thinking and our layers. And then thinking about circulation and how we move in and out of the neighborhood. It's a very well-connected neighborhood. It's not one way in and one way out. There are um, really top, bottom, and middle uh, access points to the neighborhood. Um, and, and a big part of our planning is to build on what's here already. Not to reinvent this, but to begin with what's here and to move it forward. So we've taken a lot of time to understand each of those areas. The horse trails that move through the neighborhood now, access down to Lake Butler. Um, we've studied the topography of the area. And, and we've also taken careful note of all the utilities and the infrastructure. Again, with the idea of moving forward, not backward. Um, the fact is we have a robust network of uh, utilities, electrical uh, and, and water utilities throughout the neighborhood. And we're working on, on this aspect of the project with Thomas and Hutton Engineering. Um, we, we believe one of the finest engineers in the South. Um, so, um, so that everything we do is in the context of working productively and not doing things that don't need to be undone. Um, so this is one of those early network drawings. Um, as we thought about the architectural context, and as Gene said, the, and, and this, is, this is a, we call it food for thought. This is not final and it's not conclusive. I wanted to share back some of the images that we looked through early on as we were searching for the soul of Silco thinking about what we have now in McAllister Point, what we have in Cherry Hill, what would the architecture be? An architecture of Ford, an architecture of the Low Country, um, an architecture derivative of the Low Country's European heritage. Um, what would that be? And what would make Silk Hope uniquely identifiable and not in competition with the other established neighborhoods? Knowing that we have an architecture that is allowing um, a, floor, a type of floor plan that has uh, a prominent amount of living space on the first level, master suites down on the first floor. Um, so we're not talking about a more a vertical architecture, but one that's more of, uh, of the land. And we started to think about um, sort of the pastoral model, where you have large open spaces and then compact village character. Um, we looked at some romantic uh, precedents for that um, as we thought about that, pastoral and the picturesque. Um, an architecture where the buildings and the gardens start to really become woven together, really inseparable from each other. Um, an architecture that relies on all the homes, not just one home to make a statement, but a composite. Um, and so we showed a variety of images, none of them to be taken literally, and I want to underline that. Not, none of these to be taken literally, but we sometimes will look for these inspiration points to help chart a direction. We were also interested in durability and longevity. Homes that are of low maintenance are built of high quality materials. Um, and it led us to think of masonry as a predominant palette, the use of brick, the use of slate roofs, and the use of an architecture that would have simple form languages that seem to get, um, create a, 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 a picturesque uh, composite view. Um, and we began to realize that that would lead us to thinking more about gardens and architecture together and street edges. So um, some of these precedents started to help us think about that, how um, shared spaces and gathering places would work together with the landscape um, and a language of gardens. So this, this exercise was one that we used early on to, to sort of think about 
target imagery for a character that would help us understand, again, this, this idea of searching for the soul of Silcope. Um, so we've taken uh, these palettes and details and, we, and, and this idea of the design of gardens and courtyards being very much a part of the, of the thinking, and we've brought it back now uh, into the plan. The master plan for Silcope um, that, uh, that we uh, shared with you, and I want to review it briefly with those of you that may, may, maybe are seeing this for the first time, is this. This is our conceptual master plan, but it's actually guided every single technical decision that we've made on the project. And I'm always pleased to know when we work on a project that has a clear line of, a clear path, we've gotten good feedback, we've had amazing support for the design, and we've only made it better as we've gone. But I can still show you this first image and, and map everything we've done back to this. Um, so first and foremost, at the core of the Silk Hope uh, neighborhood is the village green. The paddock grows up to become a space that's used by, by everyone, not just the horses uh, in, in the future. And, and we think there's an important identity point there, that that's a, an area that's very much already part of our image of coming to Silk Hope, and so it's, it's right that it should evolve as the signature space that's there. Um, so as you arrive at the Silk Hope neighborhood, you arrive at a, a community pavilion, a, a space that can be used uh, for entertainment. It can also just be used uh, as a set piece of architectural design for the area, and we'll talk about that in more detail. Um, the large portion of that green is an open space, and then we have a walking garden here on the western portion of, of that area. That forms the core identity of, of, uh, of the heart of the neighborhood. The Oak Alley is here, connecting from that walking garden. And then as we move up uh, toward the bird sanctuary, where Riceland Way is today, that grows up to become what we refer to in landscape terms as a close. It's a small um, uh, area of the neighborhood where the homes are gathered together. Many of the, the new homes that are coming to Silk Hope are envisioned for that, um, that, that area up there in Riceland Way, which provides access to the bird sanctuary and a walk along uh, the edge of the marsh uh, there where it meets uh, the neighborhood. We also looked at the, this long um, sort of underused easement space, and that forms a strong western boundary for the neighborhood. And we found ways to integrate that, both uh, in terms of how it provides access to homes, but actually provides a, a location to reestablish Edsel Farm uh, in a much larger, in, in, an area, in, in a space that can actually um, grow substantially over the years. Um, so that has become an important part of the neighborhood as well. Um, I should say, uh, with, in doing this, we, we kind of set out a, a, an agenda for the master plan, but we also did it within the context of the home sites that we were working with to create the new design. Um, so taking that master plan and starting to move into the more technical drawings, these were the home sites that had been previously platted um, in the area, and in the, um, the, 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 the reestablishment of the plat for Silcope, those home sites uh, evolve to conform to the master plan. And the, the end result of that in making these adjustments um, is that we, we do go from 24 to 53 homes in the Silk Hope area and the village as a whole, um, but we actually open up five acres of new common space within that larger village setting, 25% um, more uh, open space. And so at the end of the day, 40% of that area is uh, developed, 60% of it is common space in the form of, of amenities and, and neighborhood um, features that connect to each other. So I'm excited, and that's, we're gonna spend some time today talking about the design development for those features um, that are part of space that previously wasn't in service and wasn't available um, to the neighborhood. So that's been a big part of our focus, sort of thinking about the community realm. Uh, and, and then we'll also um, spend uh, time talking about the design of the homes and the, and the, 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 um, the architecture of Silk Hope on the private side. So this image here is a, a summary of that, of that larger concept kind of played out where you come into the, to the village green here, you have that large open space. It's surrounded by these durable, um, uh, and picturesque homes that line the frontages of the, of the large green. You can see the path out to the sanctuary through uh, Riceland. 
And if you walk through the, the walking garden, it actually leads you to the top of the LA. Um, and I, I should add one more um, development in that, is that this section um, just west of the walking garden, which has some amazing trees, we felt was an area that really should not have any homes in it. And that now emerges as a, a transitional space as we move out to Edsel Farm. So I'm gonna show you that in more detail. But we're really, we're so excited because we're starting to see all of these pieces fit together in a very uh, tangible way. So we've organized, I wanna thank um, Anthony and, and Craig in our office for kind of helping us organize our, our presentation around those four key areas in the master plan. We're gonna start by talking about the, the, common, the, the common spaces that are enjoyed by, uh, by all of Ford Plantation. Um, so we'll start with the Village Green Walking Garden, then we'll move on to the Oak Alley at Silcope Drive, then we'll go to Riceland and out to the Sanctuary, and then we'll look at the uh, reestablished Edsel Farm. So that's the, that's the organization for the the, the shared spaces in Silco. So starting with the Village Green and the walking garden, I've given you an orientation to this image. That concept has, uh, has been used as our foundation to develop more uh, detailed views of how that, uh, how that comes together. So here uh, on, the, on the plan that you're seeing is the extent of the open green space that you come to as you come in on uh, Silk Hope Drive from the marina. So you can see the entertainment pavilion is a, a focal point on that approach. And then this portion of, uh, of, of the, the area that's currently the paddock becomes the walking garden. And I'll show you that in, uh, in more detail in just a moment. Um, to give you an idea of, of scale and size here with the Village Green, um, it, it's a significant space. We were looking for some, some analogs, uh, and you know, I don't know if football is a good analogy, but it's about the scale of two football fields of, of open green space and, uh, right, right here. So we're, we're excited in that we feel like that adds something new to Ford and a, a space that can accommodate you know, gatherings of, of, of different sizes. Um, and of course, this pavilion becomes a, a key point, a key feature within that. So that's a, a, an enlarged view there of the Village Green. It has a more clean and, and manicured feel to it. It's a space that you can stroll through, gather in. Um, really, it, it serves as a centerpiece for the neighborhood. As we look at the approach, this is coming in from the marina. We've looked at how the pavilion that we've been developing helps to mark that entry point and sets up a moment of formality in the context of the architecture that surrounds it, which will be more picturesque and more romantic in character. And, and we think that's very, that's very much a Ford moment, these moments of unexpected formality in the plantation setting. And so the role of the, architecturally, the role of this, um, this pavilion is to help do that. And so we spent some time thinking about that since we met with you last, and of course we had to go all the way back uh, to ancient Rome. Uh, so uh, if you'll permit me. Uh, because round pavilions have a long, long history. So you have to know who you're, who you're working alongside. This is the Temple of Vesta in Rome. Um, probably the, the ultimate archetype of the round pavilion. And there's so many good examples. This is the Villa Borghese, also in Rome. And the Tempietto. Actually, I guess, thinking about it, most of these come from Rome. So, um, but it's, it's, it's true, that's where I mean, Roman architecture set this agenda for the round structure. So this is Bramante in the 1500s uh, at, at the Tempietto. So we took, we took these precedents in mind, we brought them to, um, to, to our thinking here for the community pavilion at Silk Hope, um, a building that is um, both formal but uh, also has a, 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 a bit of a rustic quality to it to fit in with the, the larger context uh, of Ford Plantation. So we're developing this design now, working with the development team, working with, uh, with Josh Brooks, uh, and, and working with Reshma through the details. Um, but what we have is a pavilion that's approximately 40 feet in diameter. So it's a sizable pavilion. Um, it's based on a series of architectural um, precedents that I mentioned you know, in the classical tradition. There's actually a perfect sphere that fits within that space. And it's also based on the, the model of thirds, where 
the, the height of the pavilion above the plinth is set in a two-third, one-third relationship, so there's some science to that. Um, it's articulated with a level of classicism. It sits on a brick plinth um, that's all, as I mentioned, it's a 40-foot diameter structure. The plinth is actually a bit wider than that. Um, but then it has a heavy timber um, roof. As we look up under the eaves, you'll see you know, heavy, robust timbers to anchor this roof uh, down. And we've set up one moment in this pavilion that really opens it up and orients it to, to the green. And that's what you're seeing here. You could think of it almost like a proscenium uh, there that takes the, uh, what's a non-directional building and gives it a moment of directionality. So if there's a performance going on inside the pavilion, you could have an audience on the lawn and enjoy that, that view through the entry point uh, there. So this is looking at a plan view of that same space. Um, this is that that entry point that, that allows you to view out toward the large green. The fact of the matter is you can walk to this pavilion from any direction and walk up onto the plinth. Um, and in fact, uh, Anthony has uh, cleverly uh, concealed uh, ramps into that plinth, the base that it sits on, so it's fully accessible um, from, from an ADA point of view um, without, um, you know, without having additional ramps that actually work right into the design of the base. Um, and we've gone, gone on and, and started to develop additional details, thinking about the materiality. Um, we're seeing the, the base of the building rendered in brick um, with drawing back toward the marina and the tabby shell um, that you see on the, on, at the marina. We see that being used for the field within the, the, the floor of the pavilion. We see a gentle dome surface uh, for that, uh, that upper portion, kind of closing the geometry of it. It also allows us to develop into the design a, a pavilion that is very classical in nature, but it also has the ability uh, to, to be used for performances. So lighting and, and, and audio and, and other technologies can actually be uh, nested up inside the, um, the attic space uh, of, that, of, of, of the section of the building. So, um, so that's just a, a little bit on the, uh, on the pavilion. Anthony, did I miss anything? Okay. I was, was going to jump in, but I was like, you got it. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> the walking garden. Um, we're, so we're going to shift our focus over. And the walking garden we, we see is really an interesting uh, and, and more delicate counterpart to the large open village green. So that sits to the west. We have two, um, what we're thinking of as gatehouses, that help mark the entry points to it. And there are, are trellises that line off of those. And then inside that space is a series of walking paths. Um, and, and we have a, a section in the middle that we're looking at a, a recessed area with a large fountain, a large, uh, and I'll, I'll show you some images and inspirations for that. Um, the agenda behind the walking path. If I could just interrupt you for one, sure. one second. Um, you may point out as we're going through all these enlargements of the plan that the house footprints that we're looking at are really sort of conceptual, um, that those are Sure, thank you. So um, Anthony just pointed out something I should have said um, previously. As we look at these community spaces, I'm really focusing on what's between the homes. The home footprints that you see shown in the, uh, in the plan are not the actual houses at this point. They're conceptual footprints that we're, we used as a, as a way of doing test fits on the sites themselves. We're going to focus on the architecture, the second part of the presentation. So those are in a sense, they're placeholders uh, to create scale. Um, so yeah, so back to, um, to sort of thinking about the garden. We looked at, at precedents for walking gardens. This is the Hester Combe Gardens. We see something, there's a level of formality in this, uh, in this area, the idea of subtle um, changes of grade. So you have some areas that feel a bit like a living room inside the middle of the neighborhood. Um, and that, that area that, that's actually set within, um, within the, the heart of the plan that we see step down just a little bit with a large uh, fountain within it. That might be you know, a fountain that um, you'd be a great place to, to, to walk your dog. I know that came up at one of the earlier meetings. What if, if we have amenities for everyone, should we have you know, a, a fountain that a dog might want to splash in? So a nice, simple fountain right in the heart of that sunken garden. Um, as we thought about those gate houses, they, we, we, were, we recalled imagery uh, of pigeon airs or dovecotes that are you know, familiar to us in the South as a model for that. And, um, and we've 
and, and we also you know, thought about um, the trellises and the arbors that will help anchor that walking garden. Um, again, we were reminded of the piers at Silk Hope, thinking about the idea that perhaps the piers are derivative of those, the, those tabby piers with wood truss, uh, timber, simple timber roof. Um, so we have design uh, for these, these gatehouses for the garden that's developing, as, uh, as you can see here. Um, and what these allow us to do is actually incorporate uh, some restroom functionality at the Village Green. So one of the gatehouses is designed to have a, two ADA restrooms in it, and the other is designed um, as a support space and, and a service space for, uh, for the Silk Hope neighborhood. So they're, they're compact footprints, they're 16 feet uh, square buildings, but they're meant to really draw on the material palette. They're less, certainly less formal than the pavilion, and here we're seeing a, a mixture of uh, tabby again and, and brick detailing, simple roof lines, really drawing on th that tradition of the dovecote. Um, so we think about those open spaces and those common spaces, and we think about the quality of the edges of the neighborhood, where these common spaces meet the, the homes and, and the streetscapes. Um, so you know, again, we looked at, this is the south side of the green village park, we call it Village Park Way, thinking about the frontages of homes. One of the features that all of the homes share is a courtyard. So if you have a home footprint, you have a courtyard that's next to it. Um, and that courtyard has a presentation from the street, sort of a zone that you move through to get into the courtyard and then into the home. So we've been thinking from a, from a community perspective, what is the nature and character of those edges? These were some of the images that, that resonated early on. The idea of low walls, um, landscaping, starting to frame uh, terraced gardens and private gardens just beyond as you make your way into the heart of the home. Some of the images we found inspirational and starting to help us form an image of the design of those gardens. So, so this first segment really is this focus of the village green, the, the pavilions, the walking garden, and how the homes would front onto that space. Um, with that in mind, and this uh, over the span of the last um, number of months now, we've been identifying team members to, um, to invite, to join us in this journey that we're on. And as it rela relates to the garden, the walking garden, we're really pleased um, to be uh, working now with Sheila Wertimer, um, with Wertimer and Associates, um, based in Charleston. Um, but Sheila has been really over 30 years been involved in hundreds of really signature landscape designs throughout, uh, throughout Savannah, throughout Charleston, throughout the Low Country, and in national um, landmarks like Drayton Hall. Um, so I've, I've known Sheila for some time, and I felt like she would be the perfect team member to add to support the landscape design within uh, the walking garden, and she was thrilled um, to join the team. Um, and again, I, I have to thank our, our development team for being open to the recommendations as we've moved along to bring in, um, at, at every step, to bring in uh, top talent to help with specific aspects of this project. So, um, so there'll be more to come on the walking garden, but just wanted to show an example of some of um, Sheila Wertimer's work. There's a strong sense of, of line and architecture. There's often a simplicity to it, but a very much very, a very distinguished approach to all the work that she does. I'm a huge fan of hers. Um, so she's, she's absolutely thrilled to become a part of this project and um, to support us with the design of the, of the garden. This is an example of, of m many of her projects. Okay, so we're going to move on to the Oak Alley at Silk Hope Drive. You see it here from the, uh, from the overall master plan. This is one of those spaces that's so sublime, the real operation is to keep it really simple. The, the architecture of the trees is already there. Um, and what we have um, uh, been, been developing over the last number of months is a, an approach to really unlocking the usefulness and the, enjoy, the enjoyment of that wonderful cathedral of, of live oak canopy that's there. So on this enlargement that you see, um, the trees are mapped here. We have a from end to end um, that would be a, a, a crushed shell path, very much like the path there at McAllister Point. 
Um, there is one of the horse trails actually comes through the park as it does today, and that would be there, and that would be reinforced at its, at its crossing point. Um, and then we're developing between the, the, the pairs of trees, we're developing little areas uh, that are, are sort of pulled off with benches. So you have small seating areas, like a little living room inside this cathedral, or you might even think of it like a side chapel inside the nave of a cathedral. Um, at, at end to end on the, um, on the LA, we're recommending kind of start and stop points. Um, LAs were meant to, to, to begin and to end. And this LA is a little bit confused. It's sort of floating in outer space because it lost its plantation at the end and it lost its buildup. So we thought one of the ways to approach this where it is is actually to, to, to be a part of subtly completing it, giving it a way to start and stop. So as you approach the end of the path, we have a, a, a decision point where then you can move off uh, toward the farm or toward the walking garden as you move up uh, into the heart of the Silk Hope neighborhood, or just you know, simply have a nice terminating point at the southern end. So we'll show you a little more detail there. Um, there it is. It's pretty, pretty much perfect as is. Um, our, our thinking there was to just establish a simple path down the middle and keep it open. Um, lessons learned there. Um, we, we, we are looking at establishing a, a rhythm of gas lanterns in the Ford way um, down the length of that LA, um, but they, they actually oscillate from side to side on the path so they don't, they don't obstruct your view down the center. Um, and then as we move to the ends, we're looking at developing a small feature um, that would uh, be positioned to help sort of mark that, that entry point where you would make a decision to walk toward the English Garden or out toward, um, uh, toward, the, toward Edsel Farm. Um, so we've also looked at developing sort of this, a, a compact feature, another moment of just a little bit of formality here, um, but also in a rustic language. So we're envisioning this sort of human-scaled um, obelisk with a, a stone base and a tabby, a cast tabby uh, upper shaft. Um, one of those at either end to help help this LA just have a little bit of a start and a stop point um, and, and contain it. Um, and it, I guess we can say it's very much in the tradition of these garden elements that we see uh, at Ford. Uh, the materials and the details at the LA we see um, coming from the palette here at Ford, configured differently because of the difference of this space. Um, but, but the brick edging, the crushed shell walks. That's, that's what we're uh, envisioning. The gas lanterns kind of moving back and forth across that space and then um, some um, lighting for the tree canopies, both, uh, both up and some moonlighting coming through those canopies to make that space safe and enjoyable uh, also in the evening. All right, so we'll move on to the third area, the, uh, the reestablishment of uh, Edsel Farm, the community farm. And our thinking here is to start to activate the, the long uh, base that provides connection out to the sanctuary and down to Lake Butler. Um, we had, had kind of sketched that out in the early master planning process and spent uh, a good bit of time now developing that. This is that, that long easement uh, that's there. And then there's a, a berm that moves up uh, as you move to the very edge of the property um, and, and the rail that's just beyond that. We had. Uh, started this thought process of thinking of this as a, a raised garden along that uh, easement. We would have a, a lane that provides access to the rear of the homes there, something that you could easily walk down and enjoy. And we started to think about how a raised garden could become part of that, of that space. So we, we've gone ahead now and developed this in more detail. Um, to orient you on the master plan, this is the edge of the walking garden. And there's a, an area of trees between the walking garden and Edsel Farm that are, are really stunning. Um, this was an area we felt really there should not be any homes developed. It was actually previously platted as a lot, which would have been tragic, we think, because you couldn't have put a house on this site without removing some of these trees. Um, so we felt like that's one of those, those special places in the plan. And it should just be a very natural canopy, you know, kind of a shady space to walk through as you leave the, uh, the walking garden. So you can kind of come around here and make your way out toward Edsel Farm. We're imagining uh, and, and now developing details for a farm that is a linear farm along that, 
that, that long space that sort of captures the view in this, this window from uh, the walking garden uh, that's out there. And we, what we're, we're doing as we develop it is we're thinking of it as a farm that starts to work with the, the topography and the berm that's there. So there's a series of terraces in that farm that creates shelves in which uh, you know, different you know, growing can, uh, can take place. So we've studied a series of precedents, think about how to activate that. These are some of the um, precedent images that we, we've been looking at and developing design for that. I believe in area, the scale of the new uh, farm is, Craig, help the planting area the existing asset. Okay, so, so the, yeah, it's, and, expandable. it's extremely expandable, but what we've shown currently is twice the size of, of the existing Edsel farm. Um, we also think that one of the amenities uh, that, that's part of supporting the farm is a simple sort of barn-like structure that can help with storage of equipment, but it can also be a gathering place, a you know, place for planting or a place for uh, classes or, 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 or small gatherings uh, that, are, that are, are, are being programmed to work alongside uh, the functions of the farm. So we've been thinking about uh, the location design of a building like this uh, to be located there at Edsel Farm. So um, what you're seeing here um, is the, the lane that would go from Lake Butler out to the Burke Sanctuary. This is the footprint we've developed for that, that barn structure. We have in the farm the series of terraces that are here and uh, an at-grade uh, section of the farm. And there is a fence around the entire um, collective there to, to provide you know, you know, some, some containment to it, keep critters and... Uh, and other uh, undesirable animals out. Um, and we're, we are looking at this technically as we do it. We've, we've started a whole series of um, solar studies. We've created three-dimensional models for the entire area so we can understand uh, solar exposure at different times of day, different times of year. So we, we understand the, the dynamics of the relocation of the farm and ensuring that we put it in a location that will be conducive to growing year-round. Um, we've also thought about other, other aspects of this path from the garden to the farm, um, particularly uh, an area that would serve very well as a children's play area. So we're back in that, that middle zone with the large trees. So we're, we're seeing that um, being a, a really nice sort of informal place, some arbors with bench swings and, uh, and, and a play area there that's identified uh, beneath the trees. Again, drawing on models that are here uh, today. Imagine swinging benches in arbors, sort of simple landscape um, below those, those really beautiful oaks. Okay, and then moving out to the fourth study area, as we look at, uh, out toward the sanctuary in Riceland Way. Here we are on the uh, conceptual master plan. Let's kind of get your, your bearings. Um, this path leads to the sanctuary, this path leads to the to the lane, which returns back down to Lake Butler. Um, and what, what's created in the center is a shared uh, common space and then a passage out to, uh, to a, a park along the sanctuary that's there. So we've developed this area also in greater detail now. Um, so uh, here again, you're, you're seeing the, uh, the geometry of that uh, street. We're taking what's there today in Riceland and expanding on it to complete it. Um, what, what, what starts to form up in the middle here is, is, is referred to as a close, a landscape area that the homes front onto and enjoy. There's a passage through here and a fire pit out on the point, uh, out on the sanctuary. And then at the end of the road here, a platform overlooking the sanctuary. There, a great place to go walk in the evening, maybe have a glass of wine. Uh, and then walk along the edge, walk out to the fire pit, walk back down to the lane. Um, one of the things that's really developed is that there's a lot of network. There's a lot of places that you can walk and explore and move through the neighborhood that really can be enjoyed by, by everyone. Um, I think I've, I've mentioned this, but I want to I touch on this because it's an important feature of the design, that all of the homes have small lanes that provide access from the rear. So, you, so um, and that's true here in Riceland Way as well. So you have a kind of a soft network of, of cr uh, crushed gravel lanes that provide access to the back of the homes so that the front of the homes face out more formally onto the streets and their gardens enjoy 
uh, their, that exposure also out onto the main street. That's really throughout the entire design. Um, what, what, what's emerged too, I should also say with that, is that there are, are additional open spaces and shared green spaces that are actually behind the homes. So that lane isn't just about access to the back of the house, but it actually looks out onto these small pocket greens throughout the neighborhood that a, you know, a smaller group of homes might you know, you know, enjoy on a more individual basis as, as, a, as a group. Um, so looking at that, that centerpiece, we were um, taken by images of sort of the, the town well, a marker point there, as we thought about uh, how we would develop that, that triangular um, close, right in the heart of Riceland Way. Um, again, here we're thinking water is a, a, an appropriate feature to bring in, kind of a, a town well. So we are showing a water feature there, benches that look onto it, and then entry points you can sort of naturally walk into that space and, and enjoy it, uh, and then landscape around its edges, sort of creating a, a um, uh, kind, of, kind of an enclosed edge to it as you look at its perimeter. And we've also been looking hard at, at the street design uh, there along Riceland Way, thinking about how to keep things feeling compact, but yet leaving the width that's needed for emergency vehicles and fire trucks. Um, so, so one of those things is to actually break up, not have you know, asphalt end to end, but to actually switch to other materials that start to create a more textural um, character to it. Um, so you know, in this image, this is not to be looked at for uh, everything above the line, but in fact, everything below the line. Um, what we're really taken with here is the idea that the, the paving is actually a narrower section, and then you move to brick and cobble and stone to have a, a more textured, softer edge there. And that also sets up some areas where you know, a guest could pull off and park a car, um, and you don't feel like the streets have gotten too wide. Um, and it fits into this idea of these soft edges that have an informality. The landscape moves out into it and then pulls back from it. Now, moving out toward the, uh, toward the sanctuary edge as we move to the top of Riceland, we have that, that overlook um, there, and then we have uh, a garden that we walk through um, to get out toward a fire pit that's there. We're imagining the garden that you walk through is a little bit um, sort of a, a potted garden, so it has sort of a, a fun but sort of informal feel to it. This is a precedent image um, that we saw there, and then that takes us out to, um, to a fire pit this, again, is a precedent image, not to be taken uh, literally. But we really, the character that we see out there is one very much like what we see here at McAllister Point as we move out to the edge toward the, uh, toward, toward the marsh and the sanctuary. So, so Riceland Way is very much a special part of the, the larger Silcope neighborhood. A lot of opportunities there. So um, with that, developing, those are the elements that are really part of the whole community and all of Ford Plantation. So we start to think about the architecture and the, the, you know, the, the private uh, side of it and the offering for architecture and the design of architecture. Um, we, you know, as a team, sort of look, looked at the direction this project was going in and who we felt would be best uh, to join the team um, and, and, and to invite along on this journey. And um, I'm absolutely thrilled uh, to introduce uh, McAlpin Ar Architects to, uh, to the Silk Hope project as a, a part of moving now into the design of homes themselves. And um, for those of you that are not familiar with their work, I'd encourage you to, um, to, to take a look at um, work that they've done in the past. Certainly, you can look at their website. Um, Chris Tippett is here uh, today, and I've known Chris now for almost 15 years. Um, Chris has been a, 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 is, a, is a partner at McAlpin, has been with the firm for 25 years, and is at the heart of um, a, 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 some of their most exquisite work. Um, when I met with Chris and showed him what we're doing here in Silcope, he immediately lit up and, and got it. And we really, uh, again, I want to thank our, our project team in, at every turn, allowing us to bring the best partners to this project. So I'm very excited. To, to, to introduce Chris this afternoon. And, and Chris is going to uh, uh, take over this next segment of the presentation as we talk about uh, the design of the homes. Uh, but I could not think, I just have to say, I could not think of a more perfect partner for this project in the direction that we're heading in. 
And I will say we, we have um, a few copies of a book that just recently came out. I think you'll show some images from it, um, which as I understand is the best seller on Amazon right now for, for architecture, if that's true. So, um, but it's, it's just you know, stunning work. And um, without further ado, I'd like to, um, to introduce uh, Chris Tippett uh, to, to walk us through this next part of the presentation. Well, yeah. Good afternoon. I'm Chris Tippett. Thank you all for having me. Thank you for inviting me. Christian, I was in indeed thrilled when he came. Sorry, I need to talk into this, don't I? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I was, when Christian came and presented this, um, we are an all residential firm and we mostly do custom houses for individual clients. And, but we all have a passion for the smaller house. We all love cottages. We all live in them. Um, and so to have the opportunity to work on something like this and to create um, a body of work where there is one where you get to see everything to work as part of a whole and to not just have houses spread in the city and the city and the city but basically be able to build uh, a community and I think what Christian said that kind of got me involved more than anything was the fact that it's the sum of all the parts. It's not one individual house. And I think you see in the images that he showed you that he showed to me that day where none of those houses stood out, but they all worked together to be one collective. And um, uh, you see that a lot in, in a lot of communities these days. Okay. Um, we're going to do a little introduction uh, after I talk, but, but to, do it in a, to do it with some really nice architecture that is built of the right materials, built with the right details, and they're not overly complicated, but they're all done with integrity and they have are built of lasting materials. Um, we always say that uh, our form of green architecture is building houses that are inheritable houses, so that they're not just for the generation that's building them, they're, but they're for two generations down the road. And if you can build them to last and they look better 30 years down the road than they did the day that you built them, then you've done something right, in our opinion. So I'm um, going to show a brief little video that is, you can find on our website that kind of explains a little bit about us. And then we're going to show some slides. started in Montgomery, Alabama in 1983, um, and uh, Bobby McAlpin uh, is the founder, and uh, he was a graduate of Auburn University, and for the most part, most of us were 
are graduates of Auburn, and so we are distinctly a Southern firm. Uh, we now have offices in Atlanta, Nashville, and New York, uh, just because some of our partners want to live in those places, so that's where they are. Um, and uh, But um, we are, in the past year and a half, we changed our name to simply be McAlpin, and it is not McAlpin Architecture, it's not McAlpin Interiors, it's just McAlpin, and we do the things that you see, architecture, interiors, and create homes, that's what we try to do. And um, so to be invited, to be a part of this, to try to create uh, these houses and to create a village is, is a perfect thing for us. Been, I've been waiting for somebody to ask us to do something like this for a long time. We've had a couple small opportunities, but never, never anything like this. Um, so I want to show you some projects just to kind of, sh to, as an introduction as to who we are, of things that we've done. And most of these images are from the new book um, uh, that's uh, uh, just come out this week or a couple weeks ago. And um, so... Here we go. Um, so this is a house in Greenville, South Carolina, and we're, uh, we're asked by the owner to build a house on his family home's property. So it's in the heart of Greenville, believe it or not. It's on about 10 acres, but it's in the middle of Greenville, South Carolina. And he asked us to, he basically tore down his father's house, which was a 1940s uh, ranch house, and then wanted us to build a house back on the essential footprint, basically the same footprint. So it, has some odd quirks to it because of that. But I, I show it because it is built of real materials. It is built of stone and slate and thatch and wood timber. And it is built to basically be old the minute that you build it and to look better 20 years down the road than it looks the day that we finished it. Um, so this is a view from the motor court um, uh, going up toward the front door of the house. There's a low wall that comes off over here that is actually a building. Uh, uh, sorry, um, that is that leads to the master wing and the house is a Y. The old house was, had, was shaped like a Y so we built this angular wing to, to, to do that. It's a closer image of the front door. Left and right is a living room and a dining room. So a stone center and then a glass that you can see through. Every room in this house is one room deep. So you get to see in two directions and three directions every single room of this house. Uh, this is coming from the back motor court, coming into the back house, uh, back of the house is how they would come home every day if they were parked in the motor court and they would walk past this guest house and down this pathway and lead to the door that's opposite the front door and to the left of you is the family room and a kitchen that look out into a courtyard. This is the living room. You can see the windows on both sides. You can also see the front door just beyond the curtains there on the right. Dining room. Um, the house is also stone inside. It's uh, with timber ceilings. It is built like a nave of a church. It is 15 feet tall and it is 18 feet wide and it's about 45 feet long, one big room uh, that's divided by these two chimney masses. That's at the end of the dining room. And then that's looking off of the, the, the thatched porch there. Um, this is um, a family in Birmingham. They came to us and they were living on this lot. It was a pie-shaped lot, literally looked like a piece of pie. And they asked us to build a house on it and they wanted to kind of be reminiscent of the house that they had there before, which was a wood shingle house. And so the house basically is a telescope. It gets wider at the back and then narrows as it goes forward. So the front room here is one room deep and then it gets bigger and wider and wider as it goes back to accommodate the pie shape of the lot and to deal with all the setbacks. It is built in a carpenter gothic um, style, true southern carpenter gothic is what this I would call this. Um, that's the living room with the master bedroom above it. When you drive down the street, before the street separates into two separate streets, you're looking at that window. That's what you see as you drive down the street. That's the front door tucked around onto the side. It's not the, the first thing that you see when you drive up. You tuck on, you walk in and there's a dining room. You're received by the dining table when you walk in, which you'll see, I think in the next, well, this is the living room. So you're looking, that's the big window that we saw a minute ago. It's a three-sided room. It's very small. It's not a big room. It's 15 by 20. And that's, that dining room is the same part of that. And you've entered 
off here looking at the center of that table when you come in. Again, a very tall ceiling, um, but, a very, but very simple. This is uh, the breakfast room of the house. It's one, there's a breakfast room at one end, there's a family room in the middle, and then there's a kitchen at the other end. It's one long room. Um, this is a very small kitchen, but it has a, a very efficient uh, walk-in pantry that's right here through this door, and it all is one room. Very similar to some of the things you're going to see in the plans that I'm going to show you later, later on, that basically it's designed for the family to all be in that one room. And, um, and they, they use it every time I'm there. There are 12 kids in the neighborhood running through that house all the time, and it is just, the house is used up, and it's probably the smallest kitchen in the whole neighborhood. Um, this, you get asked to do things sometimes that are just great. So this is a, a, a gentleman who lives in, in Virginia, but this is Greenville, Alabama. He went back and reamassed his family's farm and land, and he bought it over 20 years, and then wanted to build something on it. And he came to us and he said, I want to be able to sit on my porch and fish, and I'll be able to open my window and shoot my gun. <laughs> Um, so as you can see and you'll see closer the house sits right on the lake and he has double hung windows that he can raise up and he can shoot his gun if he wants Um, again another carpenter gothic style house Uh, just chose red because it seemed very appropriate for where we were a little you know carpenter gothic red schoolhouse kind of imagery for this Um, that's the front door there Um, wood roof, uh, a mixture of very humble materials in all of this. Uh, you've got the field stone that is the pathway. Uh, you've got a galvanized roof, a wood roof. Um, and, and then everything in this ages well. Everything looks better the older it gets. It doesn't look the best it's ever going to look the day that you move into the house. Um, and if it gets a little cracked and it gets some cobwebs on it and it gets all kinds of things growing on it, all the better. Um, so there you go. He can sit on his porch, uh, and he can fish. He's got a, a, little, a little fish house a little further down on the, on the pond there. But it is an absolutely beautiful piece of property and, uh, that he took 20 years to amass and then built this lovely little cottage on. <clears throat> That's his boat house. This keeps a few little boat houses in there, and then he has a all of his fishing tackle and everything is in the little building next to it. Um, this is a project in Philadelphia. Uh, and uh, they came to us and we designed a house that was on an infill lot. We went through the whole entire process. Their neighbors were terrible. They didn't want them to build the house, didn't want them to build the house. So they said, forget it. We're going to scrap the house. They bought what was a perfectly lovely house for most people. And they said, we don't want to renovate it. We want you to build something new. They tore it down, and we built this. Um, So um, it was, I I was amazed. uh, We both walked in, Bobby and I both walked in, expecting them to say, okay, we want you to renovate this house. And when they said, we know it's nice, but it doesn't have any of the things that we want. It's not who we are. We want to start all over again. So they asked for an English house. And uh, so uh, this is, uh, again, a stone house, uh, wood windows, slate roof. And uh, so it is for two people. (laughs) Um, And uh, so the the main body of the house is here. Uh, The master bed, master wing is here. And then there are two, there's a garage building that houses the two guests, the two guest rooms. So the whole entire first floor of this house is basically just for the two of them. And then they only have two guest, guest bedrooms that are on the second floor. This is an existing pond that was there. You're looking at the master wing. So this whole building here is their master bedroom, bathrooms, closet, and his office. And he has this great wraparound porch that looks out onto this pond and then looks out onto a vineyard. They have the best, they own six acres, but they get to look at 75 acres of a vineyard that somebody else owns and gets to maintain. So they get to see it, but they don't have to do any of the work. It's really great. (laughs) So um, uh, that's when you're walking from the, the, the the, the motor court, you look at this, this is the, looking at the, li- the dining room and the kitchen. Again, you can see all the way through the house. Most of our houses, we try to be one room deep as much as we can, so you have three exposures. 
very similar to what we're try trying to do here. You're trying to, you're trying to be outside and be a part of the outside, having a courtyard, having as much light in the house as you possibly can, and looking at what the reason that you bought the property. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, you know, there's a reason why you bought the property, and so you want to be able to see it and not be uh, in a dark room. And so we want to make sure you can take in all the things that you've, the reason that you bought the property. Um, the master wing, this is actually her, uh, this is a bay where the, where the tub is. <laughs> um, and a lot of these projects, we also were lucky to work with a, a very talented landscape architects and interior designers ourselves and other interior designers. But as Christian was talking earlier, it is very important in any kind of project to put together a really good team. And that is um, a really great client. Um, and everybody else is involved, architect, landscape architect, builder, interior designer, all those things are important. And the same thing here, uh, having the vision of Christian and his group and uh, Josh, Gene, the vision that y'all had to do this and being able to use the resources you have to do it right is very inspiring for us. Ooh, what did I do? No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch uh, to the... <laughs> okay. To the presentation. Oh, oh we so need to move on? Okay, okay, we're good. Okay. So, here we go. Okay. Oh, you're, you're cutting right, me so off. We're gonna, we're you're cutting me off. Okay, I got it. Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, so, uh, these are very beginning ideas of what Christian came to us and said, we, we'd love for you to show us some ideas for some 2,400 square foot houses to 32 or 3,400. And so I went, he asked for four. I think I sent him eight. Uh, but anyway, really I got a little carried away. Um, but so I'm going to walk you through uh, this real quick. So what, what we were asked to do, let me give you the program. Basically, we wanted, as he said earlier, they wanted to have a courtyard. Um, they wanted the porch and the things to be kind of off the street, not the typical kind of front front porch uh, that you have. We needed a living room, a dining room, a kitchen, you know, a, a powder room, and a master, a master on the ground, uh, and a place to park a car and a cart, and for you to be able to enter the house from the alley and from the courtyard side, so that you, if you come in from the back, you get the same experience or close to the same experience uh, when you come in the back door as you do from the front door, which we already incorporate, I feel like we incorporate a lot into our plans anyway. So. Um, so there's a gate we have showing a wall here. Let's see if I can get the pointer to work. Okay, so did I just do that or did you do that? Thank you, you do that. Great, you do all the drawing and I'll just talk. Um, so we have a porch on the front that's in front, of the, in front of the master bedroom and then the door is tucked underneath there so you walk in. But the back door is directly opposite the front door and then there's a stair that takes you up to the second floor. Um, so, and then when we come in, we're in a, a pathway that then leads you to a dining space, not necessarily a dining room, but it's all one room. So you have a dining area, a living area, and an additional sitting area at the front. So it is a 40 foot long room that's 15, that's 15 foot wide that then makes a T. And then the kitchen is also a part of that. So it really makes a big T. The whole, the whole thing is just one living space. Um, and you have a walk-in pantry, uh, a laundry room, a powder room, a coat closet, and then you have a master bedroom that looks out through the porch, looks to the garden in the front, uh, two walk-in closets, and then a bathroom that faces the back that actually has a water closet, a shower, two vanities, and a tub. So it has everything that somebody would want in a master bedroom, the things that we get asked for every single day, a walk-in closet, I need to have my own water closet, I need to have a separate shower, we need to have our own vanity. So I feel like in 2,400 square feet, we've been able to give kind of what everybody wants um, for their houses. Um, so, and then there are a couple of different versions for the upstairs. One where you have a two bedroom version of it, one where we can have a three bedroom or a two bedroom and a sitting area version. There are lots of different versions and what we're hoping to do is to have a plan and then for there to be some alternates to that plan. They may have a slightly different variation on the floor plan and also a slightly different variation on the exterior. But again, um, I don't know if any of y'all been to Alice Beach. Everybody, anybody been to Alice Beach? You know that when you look at Alice Beach, it is not about each individual house. It is a collective whole that works together. They're all very different, but they're all white, so they all look like they're one thing. Um, again, I think that's kind of the idea here is that we be, that the whole is, is, is greater than the sum. Um, so 
I was also, we talked about cottages, talked about making sure it had a cottage feel to it, that it, it seemed like a one-story house that had rooms in the second, that were kind of in the attic, and so that's kind of where this started. Um, and so what faces the street is actually uh, the roof kind of sloping down. You have a gate that takes you into the courtyard. Uh, then you have a very tall element where the fireplace is, and you can see the tall windows that are in the living room there. Um, and then you have the master wing and the porch. Um, again, slate roof, painted brick is what we're thinking here, um, is, is the idea. Yeah. And, and ceiling heights, too. I think one yeah, of the ceiling ideas heights. Yeah. So they're, they're about 11 feet is kind of where we're trying to get in the main spaces. Not every space is going to be 11 feet tall, but the main living spaces would be in the 10 to 11 foot range is what I've, I've worked on. And then the other areas will be in the 9 foot range. But if these other ceilings are a little shorter, it makes the bigger room ceilings feel taller. So there's, you don't ha not every room has to be 10 feet tall. Uh, it's nice to have a little bit of variety, especially in a cottage. And some of the best rooms you've ever been in were eight feet tall. They just had great beams and they, were, they felt great. And, and I think you need to take advantage of that in this type of architecture that you, you use uh, lower, quainter spaces to your advantage. Um, so then these are just some ex expounding uh, additional drawings to kind of show possibly what the side and the alley elevation of this particular uh, scheme might look like. You can see the entry door here, um, but trying to keep the form simple. Um, uh, and they're the main reason for that is the simpler the forms are, the simpler the details are, the nicer materials you can use. If you try to do 12 things and you have a really complicated shape and you have all these things going on, then you spend money on corners and, and all those things as opposed to spending them on the things that you actually touch every day, hardware, plumbing fittings and fixtures, what your countertops are, what the actual outside is made out of. You can spend more money on those things if you use a simpler form. Um, so again, all of these are just slight, slight variations on that. You know, this one, we've moved the porch to the front. Again, still one big room there and the kitchen being kind of making an L off of it. Um, and the master bedroom, again, looking out onto the courtyard. Um, and, and again, an additional, you can come in. This is a little different in the fact that you actually enter from the street. But again, you have a nice entrance from the back that enters into a stair hall that takes you to the upper floor. So you're looking at the stair when you come in. Um, and then just uh, an example of what the upstairs might be, where you have the stair going up and two bedrooms, each with their own bathroom, a small sitting area. So then this would be the street elevation, uh, the side elevation, which also would possibly be facing another street, depending on what lot that was on. Um, courtyard elevation here, and then the alley elevation of this, of this, of this one. Um, true courtyard house kind of idea, like you see in Charleston, where you enter through a brick wall and go onto the porch and then go into the house. Uh, the living room is all across the front. You enter into the dining room in this case, um, and but you can front and back you enter into the dining room, um, and then the kitchen is tucked here next to the next to the living room, looking toward the front, and we have a big bay window that's on the front that looks out to the green space. Again, the master bedroom in most of these is kind of repeatable, and it it will be able to move around a little bit. This version is a two-bedroom version on the second floor, so it's a three-bedroom house. Um, just strong, simple gables here with a big bay, the bay being the main feature on this and the, and the, and the entry door being the main feature. Um, this um, similar feel, you enter into the courtyard, porch on the side, living room on the front. You also get a breakfast room here facing the front here on this, in this scheme. Uh, kitchen there tucked to the side. Dining room, again, part of this entry sequence. We found through our years that dining rooms can handle traffic better than any other room, and it's the room that nobody uses. So if you put it in the heart of the house, it's a good still life that you walk past every day and you feel more comfortable when you sit down there and actually eat uh, as, a, as a family as opposed to it being a room you never go into. Um, so uh, again, the stair hall of the entry hall back to front with the stair hall, the stair being located in that same entry hall. Um, 
Uh, this one incorporates a little bit more wood in it. Uh, both of these rolling down aspects here here would all be wood, wood timbers and, and wood siding there above a brick uh, water table there. I think we're going to have two elevations in this one, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, um, and so this is, uh, just for an example, a larger scale house here. So this is basically a three bedroom, a much bigger version would go in a bigger lot um, where you enter from a porch, walk underneath, walk past the stair, go into a dining room, living room where you're looking at the dining room, living room when you walk in, a sitting room, yeah, sitting room there, here, and a kitchen here. Uh, master bedroom, again, very similar to what we did before, just a little bit bigger version of that. Um, bigger walk-in closets. And then the second floor is uh, three bedrooms uh, and three baths and a laundry room on the second floor of this one. And then a, just a beginning image of, of, of this. Again, all these are beginning ideas uh, to try to get the ball rolling for us to talk about where we want to go with all this. So don't, don't hold us to all these things. Um, um, so then that's the master bedroom end of the house there. So okay. again, thank you for inviting me to come. Thank you. Chris, yeah. There's an enormous amount of, of thought in these initial designs, and we, we're, we're excited. We feel like we're starting to see a form and an identity emerge uh, around the architecture. And actually, there was a little bit more to talk about, because once, once these homes start to emerge as, as, uh, as models uh, for design, then the question is, okay, so how do they start to work together to, to build those, um, the, the community character of the streetscape? So, um, so, much like Christian did, we, we, this is just a site plan of us actually putting the houses that we have drawn onto the site plans that they had given us and uh, to try to see if they would fit and, uh, and how they work together to start to create a language. So this is a site plan kind of showing the, the roof plans of those houses. And then these are showing how the houses might look together if they are on a street together. This is actually on, a, on the bigger lots showing kind of what the, the different types of houses and how they might sit next to one another and begin to form a language. Um, and then, so as you can see in these, and I purposely did this, we basically used the same two houses, but basically had one on one end, one on the other, and then put the two right next to one another. So seeing that even though the two houses are identical, or the four houses are only two different house types, that they still have character and they still can begin to form a language for the street. Same idea here, uh, just two house types, uh, basically using each one as a bookend and then putting the two in the middle. Um, and again, these are just trying to see what the character might look like together. And then this is showing from the green uh, where Rice, Riceland Way goes between the buildings, what those, all those houses linked together uh, might start to look like. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yep. So we were, do, you know, it, as Chris was doing that, we were doing uh, the same thing. And it's been an exciting process of starting to bring together the design direction for the project as a whole as we work on the the um, community realm and the fit of these homes together, um, it, the, the development of these, uh, of these initial designs for the, the private homes are coming back and now we're, we're looking at the master plan in the context of those homes. So for example, earlier when we looked at that plan for the Village Green where we had these simple templates for footprints as a way of creating scale, we're now going back to those drawings and we're updating them and we're using some of the models that, that McAlpin is developing for the private homes to look at how they fit together. So here you're looking at a, a, at a grouping of four of those homes um, and their, their footprints here like this. Um, each of these homes has its own enclosed garage and enclosed um, carport uh, area for, um, for golf carts. Each has its own front garden that you enter through before entering into the home. And, and the streetscape is sort of a, a rhythm of gardens and frontages. And that's really one of the, one of the big ideas here. And I think the, the homes are starting to, to bear this out as, a, as the initial development um, comes forward, is that it's not all at the street. Parts of the home come forward, parts of it move back. So it's very much a three-dimensional 
environment. So we've been studying that. Um, you know, uh, this is just a slightly closer view. You can see there's an informality to it, the way the porches provide access to the homes, sometimes along the side of the, the mass, sometimes toward the rear of the garden. Um, but then also taking a closer look at that, uh, building on, on those compositions that um, Chris just showed us to start to see how these homes work together as a family of architecture for Silk Hope. Have some closer views there. Um, and it's important to, to, to also sort of underscore the idea, and, and I think you said it really well, that the permanence and durability of these homes, these are really designed for less maintenance, they're designed to get better with time, um, and, and they're, they build on the, the traditions that are um, native to the low country, and at the same time, we believe will create a place um, that will have n no comparison in the low country. Um, so um, so we're, we're excited. I think that, that concludes our, um, our design presentation. I wanna, I'll, I'll pass it back to, to Jean um, for, for some uh, closing remarks, but thank you. In conclusion, you know, the, the board of HMAF would, you know, like to thank the current POA club and POA boards as well as their committees and the prior ones that have worked with us on this and Mark Ray because uh, we had a lot of support. There's a tremendous amount of work yet to be done, but without everybody pulling in the same direction, you know, we wouldn't have gotten as far as we have. Um, ben McMillan, Bob Levy, and I as the original HMAF shareholders especially I want to thank the uh, new HMAF founders for their confidence in the project and unwavering support of HMAF. I think to a person we all share the love of Ford and recognize the importance of this project to the club and to the membership. Um, as a reminder, uh, we will come to the overall membership and offer an additional capital raise. Um, obviously, there are only 19 uh, founders to date. And it's always been our intent to open this up to as many people as we can. So we'll probably sometime late in the first quarter uh, make available additional participation in the form of uh, limited partnership interests that'll be scaled at 25,000 per interest. Uh, so that will allow anyone who wants to participate, you know, the opportunity to participate. That'll end up uh, completing our overall equity capital raise, which will be a total of $7 million, you know, to, to fund the project. As I mentioned, I think it's important, um, you know, this project is by the members, for the members. None of us involved in it are getting compensated in any way whatsoever other than through our investment in the project. There are no fees being paid, you know, to anyone. Um, I also can't say it enough times, you know, the nature of a small community like this, there are lots of rumors. I touched on this before. Um, you know, I ask you again if you hear anything that bothers you uh, that seems implausible, it probably is. Um, you know, in that regard, I think it's kind of interesting. The last rumor I heard was is that we were going to construct security gates to get into Silk Hope. You know, trust me, that is not the case. We were not going to do anything like that. Um, you know, I think the benefit of a project like this being sponsored, you know, by, you know, members versus a fee developer is that we live here. We have long-term commitments here. We all love this place. And we're going to make sure it's done right. Uh, hopefully, uh, even though, you know, a lot's been thrown at everybody today architecturally, you can begin to see really what we're trying to do, where we're trying to go. Uh, we'll develop a lot more crisp renderings so you can begin to really see how this all does come together with the focus being creating a village. It will be a mixture of 
building materials, some painted, some not, um, but we think it's going to be a very high-end uh, project that I think people are really going to like. Um, so, you know, we're moving forward. We're excited about it. Um, I think, you know, it's it's a, a difficult second kind of job to, to work on something like this. It's kind of like being on the board at the Ford Plantation. Uh, it's not it's not full of fun and games, but it's important, and we all do it because we love the place. We have something very special. I think last night, you know, probably everybody here was at the oyster roast. I think that's just a great example of why this place is so special. You know, we had what 270 people, plus or minus, there. And uh, as usual, our, our staff did an unbelievable job in, in putting all that together. So I think, you know, we probably hadn't had a chance to congratulate them, but we should, you know, certainly do that in our own way, you know, today. So anyway, everybody's probably wondering what are all these boards that are turned around up here. Um, it's on purpose, so nobody will be studying those while we're trying to talk. So, um, you know, we're, we're here. Um, I can ask, answer questions about what we're doing overall, but, you know, we've got a great group of architects here. Josh is here on the builder side. Uh, we'll hang around. I know everybody's got stuff to do, but, you know, it might be a little bit easier to understand if you want. So we're here, and we can, we can answer questions from the group now, if need be, or just, you know, as you come up. So thank you.